Well, today we're talking about probably the most memorised passage in the whole Bible. Um, loads of us who grew up in Church of England schools will have recited it in, a, in old language, Our Father, which art in heaven, every morning, and it, it, it just sinks in. And actually, although at the time I didn't value that, of course, now looking back on it, best part of 50 years later, I'm really glad that I had that experience and that it's gone in. It's really useful. And there's a very obvious way to teach this passage, and that is as a template for the way that we pray. So um, you can begin by thinking, okay, our Father, and we pray about what it is that God is our Father, and our Father in heaven, what does it mean that he's in heaven? And all of that is really useful and valuable, and I would love to do it. We really don't have time in, uh, we're trying to do a 20 minute sermon. That's what we try and do these days, 20 minutes. Uh, let's see whether we come in under that period of time today. But I do want to do that. I want to go through, there are about 10 separate points in the prayer. Uh, and each of them can become for us the beginning of, of how we expand that into our own praying. So rather than try and squeeze that in this morning, we're going to put on a separate event on a Sunday evening soon. Uh, and we'll get details of that out once we've uh, firmed it up. And we'll go through the Lord's Prayer in detail and see how to use it. But that's not what I want to do today. I want to focus down on just one thing that this prayer shows us, a single thing. And it's one of the most fundamental questions of all. And that is, what is God like? Um, and you can say that the, the whole ancient world was trying to figure out what is God like. You remember when Paul was in Athens, he found a... a um, an altar that was inscribed to the unknown God so that the Greeks in Athens there realized they didn't really understand what God was like. And when you think about uh, polytheistic systems like the Greek pantheon with um, Zeus and Hades and Poseidon and all the others, you can think of those as maybe ways of, of their trying to work through understanding what's God like by viewing different aspects of his character and his uh, way he interacts with the world. Uh, but the whole Old Testament, more interestingly, can be seen as a kind of extended attempt to understand God's character. And when you look in the Old Testament, sometimes he seems very loving and merciful. Here's uh, Isaiah in chapter 54 saying, The mountains may move and the hills disappear, but even then my faithful love for you will remain, God says. My promise of blessing will never be broken, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. So that's one view of God in the Old Testament. But at other times, he appears like a very stern king. Here we are in Psalm 2, verses 4 and 5. It says this, The one who rules in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. In anger, he rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. So you might ask, well, which of these is right? We even see both aspects, uh, both of those aspects in a single verse uh, in Numbers Chapter 14 and verse 18, these are quite familiar words. We've got a worship song that uses the first half of this verse. It doesn't use the second half. See if you can figure out why. It goes, The Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion. But he does not excuse the guilty. He lays the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. What's going on there? And why don't we have a second verse of our worship song that uses the second half of that? So you've got this kind of tension all the way through the Old Testament. People trying to understand what is God like? They, they know that God is there. They worship him, but they don't really know what he's like. And then the very last book in the Old Testament is written by the prophet Malachi, short book of four chapters. Uh, and to me, it sort of sums the whole thing up because it begins with this. Malachi 1 verse 1. This is the message that the Lord gave to Israel through the prophet Malachi. I have always loved you, says the Lord. But the same book ends with this. This is Malachi 4 verse 5. Look, I'm sending you the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. Now look, that's the very end of the Old Testament. The very last word is curse. So, uh, and then you've got 400 years 
between the end of the Old Testament and the birth of Jesus. So you could say that this key question of what God is like was left hanging for 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. It's just hanging there. What's God like? Who is this God that we worship? Now, when Jesus comes, now we shift out of the Old Testament and into the New, we're told that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And by law here, they don't just mean the sets of rules and regulations, but everything that was written uh, the, and the Psalms and the Proverbs and the prophets and all the rest of it is, is also known as the law. So the Old Testament, as we now know it. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Don't come to think that I have here to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, Jesus does this in many, many ways. But the one I want to look at today is that he shows us what God is like. He answers this ancient question of what God is like. How can we relate to God? How can we pray to him if we don't know what he's like? And we see it really, really clearly in how he tells us to pray. And that, of course, is our passage for today. Remember in Matthew 6, verse 9, it begins, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Those very familiar words. But just look, let's zoom down now. Let's zoom in on just the first four words of this. This is who Jesus tells us to pray to. So the rest of it is telling us how to pray. But here, who do we pray to? Our Father in heaven. Four words, our Father in heaven. Now we might focus on the first two words here, our Father. And we address God as Father, as somebody who loves us, who gave life to us, and who would do anything for us. And this was a radical change. You know, the Jews would never have addressed God as Father. They knew that an aspect of his character was that he was the father of Israel, and that's an idea that comes up in the Old Testament, but they would never have been so familiar as to address God as Father. Yet that's how Jesus taught us to pray. But he doesn't just say Father, does he? He says our Father in heaven. Now what's he saying here? He's saying that God is not like us. He's not just one of us on earth. He's not just like a human, but better, like a giant or a superhero. No, God is in heaven. He is a king. He is the king. He is the creator. Before any of this was here, he was here. So in those four words, Jesus is telling us, look, this is the God you're praying to. He is your father, but he's also the king of heaven, the creator. And you see this sort of tension in the identity of God repeatedly, uh, that he is just, but he is merciful. And in the same way, he's a father and he's a king. Now, the whole of the rest of the prayer that Jesus then teaches us to pray uh, kind of falls into this because it addresses God really in two rather different ways or, or rather with two different kinds of concerns. So the prayer itself is asking us to see and to embrace this complexity of who God is. So the first half of it, after that opening, those crucial four words, our Father in heaven, what it then does is to address a great king of the universe. It says this, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So in these lines, we're addressing a great king. But then as the prayer goes on, it says these things, very personal things. Give us today the food that we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who've sinned against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Now, can you see that these lines are addressing a father who protects us? So both of these aspects of who God is, they're both present in those opening four words, and also they're present in the rest of the prayer. And that as we're praying in the way that Jesus taught us, he's encouraging us always to see God both as father and as king. Now, look, it's really important we understand this. We're not talking about two gods. We're not even talking about God manifesting in two different ways. It's not like sometimes he's a father, sometimes he's a king. No, he is always both of those things. The same God is both father and king all the time. 
So in the way that he teaches us to pray, Jesus is showing us a God who is more complex than we are, who has more facets to his identity than we have. And obviously, Father and King is only the beginning. And the Bible as well encourages us to think of God as, as a shepherd and as a protector uh, and as all kinds of other things. But at the moment, just focusing on even those two, that's a complicated thing for us, isn't it? You know, we sometimes would like to think, let's just make this as simple as possible. Uh, is God a father? Yes. OK, good. We think of him as father. And that's not wrong, but it's not the whole truth because the whole truth about God is more complex than we are. Now, that shouldn't come as a surprise to us, should it? If God is the creator of the universe and who is the creator of us, it would be pretty shocking if, if he was as simple as we are, if there was no more to him than there is to us. Of course there is. Of course there is. Of course God is more complex than we are. He is a father and he is a king. Now, we see these kind of tensions in some of our worship songs, some of our better worship songs. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. In Phil Wickham's song, This Is Amazing Grace, the middle section, do you remember, says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Now, the point here is that he's not talking about two people in these two lines. They're both about the same person. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. That's Jesus as a sacrifice. And worthy is the King who conquered the grave. That's Jesus as well. Too powerful to be kept dead. So those two aspects of who Jesus is held in tension in that song. Uh, and Jesus, of course, uh, is God himself in human form, uh, which is itself another complex tension that we have to hold in mind. You know, it's, it's funny, you know, people sometimes talk as though Christianity is just this kind of trivial thing for, for little children. And uh, so, so very much not true. You know, the heart of the gospel is simple enough to be grasped by anyone. But the depths of who God is and who he is to us uh, are a lifetime study and so much more. Here's another one. Here's another of our songs, The Lion and the Lamb. It's given away in the title, really. Uh, the chorus sings, Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. In other words, the King and the Master and the most powerful. Uh, and then, Our God is the Lamb. The lamb who was slain. Uh, and my favourite one is Matt Redman's song, Befriended, which opens with this couplet. Uh, befriended, befriended by the king above all kings. Surrendered, surrendered to the friend above all friends. Now, if you've heard me preaching for a while, you'll have heard me make this point before, but I am going to make it again because I, I think it's such a, a brilliant bit of songwriting in that it would have been easy and obvious to say befriended by the friend above all friends. That's what you expect a friend to do. And surrendered to the king above all kings because you would expect to surrender to a king. But what's happening in this song is, it's just switched it around. So both of those lines remind us of both of these aspects of who God is, that we are befriended, not just by a friend, but by the king above all kings. And that we're surrendered, not just to a king, but to the friend above all friends. It's deep, isn't it? Do you know, in my uh, sermon for Easter in 2018, which, by the way, you can watch at mikepreaching.wordpress.com, if you're so inclined, if you feel like you haven't had enough preaching yet today, get yourself over to mikepreaching.wordpress.com. You can find my sermon from uh, Easter 2018. And there I talk about how the resurrection shows us both the greatness and the goodness of God. Why? Because it took the great power of God to raise Jesus from the dead. And it's by the great goodness of God that we are included in that resurrection and that we are promised that the day will come when we too will be raised. But uh, I took 40 minutes to say that. So you've just had the, the 20 second summary. Uh, here's what I want to point out here. Uh, Jesus said it in four words. That's what the Lord's Prayer does at the beginning. Our Father in heaven. It's so much captured in so few words. So as we pray through the Lord's Prayer, <clears throat> we see a great king who is in heaven, whose name is holy, whose kingdom will come and whose will must be done. But also at the same time, as we're praying through the same prayer, we see a good father who gives us what we need day by day 
who forgives our sins and who protects us from temptation. So this is the God that we worship. And more than that, this is the God that Jesus invites us to pray to. So the big question when you're praying is, who are you praying to? We've all had the feeling sometimes of, of um, we're praying, we don't feel the presence of God, we feel like we're praying to the ceiling. But what's the reality as Jesus teaches us? Who is the God that we pray to? And the answer is, we're praying to a God who is willing to hear our prayer because he is good, because he's our Father. But who also is able to answer our prayer because he is great, because he's a king. He is both great and good. He is both king and father and saviour and protector and so much more. So that's what I want to draw out today from the Lord's Prayer. It's just who God is and how very much there is for us still to find and to discover and to explore about who he is.